Welcome to Jebson Prairie Reserve in Solano County, California. Today, you'll join students from the University of California, Davis, for a field lecture and study of vernal pools and valley grasslands, led by Michael Barber, Professor of Environmental Horticulture, and Louise Jackson, Associate Professor of Vegetable Crops. This is the first field trip for a class uh, that studies the vegetation of all of California. And um, we want to get across the idea of what is a plant community. That is, where the environment repeats itself, you find sort of the same plants. And sometimes, um, especially here, the boundaries of plant communities are pretty sharp. So uh, they can see that here easier than anywhere else. Everything's low to the ground. The edges of the communities, like this fernal pool back here, uh, you can walk across it, and then you're in something else, the grassland. So it's ideal. And then also it gets across the idea of how do you sample, how do you quantify uh, vegetation? How do you describe it so that somebody a thousand miles away who's never seen it could compare it to something he or she knows nearby? So that's why they're using quadrats. They're estimating the amount of ground covered by each species. They're getting a complete species list. Um, that's all part of what they're going to continue to do the rest of the quarter in different kinds of vegetation. The pools uh, begin to fill, oh, December. And then as the winter goes by, sometimes they may actually lose the water, then it comes back, depending on the storms. But generally, these pools have continuous cover by water for uh, 40 or even 80 days out of the year. And during that time, uh, plants are germinating. They're living under water, uh, getting oxygen the best way they can. They must somehow be adapted to, to anaerobic conditions. And then when the water uh, leaves, they bolt. They, they come into full flower. They spend a lot of energy growing bigger. And that's when you get this beautiful show of native plants. And what's missing in the vernal pools is the stuff that we're standing in here, the, the sort of introduced annual grasses that cover the rest of California's grasslands, not able to tolerate the, uh, the anaerobic conditions in the vernal pools. So we get a completely different vegetation type. As we drove south from uh, Dixon, the agricultural land becomes poorer and poorer. Uh, at Dixon, um, or just south of it, you're able to see plowed fields, uh, crops, a uh, very uh, good-looking brown kind of soil that's just been turned. But as you get further south, uh, the only crops that begun to be grown is alfalfa. And then when we turned on Main Prairie Road and came this way, there was a field on the left that had been plowed and then abandoned. I think some of you saw that. Uh, very typical. And across the field, across the highway, were vernal pools with gold fields in them. Probably the field that had been plowed uh, had uh, vernal pools in it also. Um, and at that point, the land is not uh, very valuable for growing crops. It is possible to grow crops on it, but very expensive because the thing that impedes the crops is a hard pan that's developed uh, maybe two feet below the soil surface. And that hard pan is, uh, in this case, here, a combination of clay and uh, silica, uh, some aluminum and iron, and a little bit of organic matter. And this combination cements itself over time into what's technically called a hard pan. The hard pan might only be a foot and a half thick, but it impedes roots from exploring the rest of the soil. It, the roots can only explore the top foot to two feet of soil. The hard pan also impedes the drainage of water. So in the wintertime, these soils become saturated. And we'll talk about why uh, some of the soils uh, have this show of flowers and other parts of the soil don't in a minute. And then the soil dries out in the summertime because it can't retain much moisture in that short in that shallow volume. Uh, it's possible to use a D9 tractor and uh, drag behind it some, some uh, uh, tongs uh, that are two or three feet deep and rip through that hard pan. 
It takes several passes to do it and extremely expensive, so most farmers don't choose to do that. The land we're standing on um, at one time was purchased by the Nature Conservancy. I forget now how many acres, 400 or something like this. It's in your handout. Um, and uh, in time, this, this land reverted to an open, uh, an open land trust. Solano County now has uh, this land. The Nature Conservancy still owns the easements on it, which requires it to be kept uh, as a protected area. Protected for two reasons. One is the grassland itself, and the other are the vernal pools. And they are using all kinds of management tools to see what works best in this management. It's not passive management, it's active management. Uh, one of the tools they're using um, in the other pasture, you can just see we drove by them, are grazing animals. Uh, not horses and not cows, uh, not heavy animals, but sheep. And these sheep are allowed to come onto the land in the springtime for a short amount of time because research has now shown that species richness is enhanced in the grassland and in the vernal pools by modest levels of grazing. Those of uh, us who might have been raised with the notion that all grazing is bad, uh, we're mistaken. In the absence of grazing, some of these species become very, very abundant. They become super dominant. They shade out other species. There's a lot of dead material that accumulates on the ground every growing season. It's called thatch. This inhibits the germination and growth of young seedlings the next year. And so in the absence of modest grazing, the number of species declines. Uh, species richness goes down. There used to be like, there was antelope and stuff like that that did that. Good point. What was here before domesticated livestock, there were pronghorn antelope, <clears throat> there were tule elk, there were deer. There are also lots of rodents. We saw a rabbit go by. Um, so there, there are grazing animals. There have always been grazing animals here. I think you're aware that um, soils are classified just as organisms are classified and that soils are classified based on their profile. You, you dig through a soil, dig a soil pit, and it reveals layers uh, like a cake that have different colors, different textures, different chemistry. And these layers are what is used to classify soils into um, orders, families. Um, the lower unit, similar to a genus for soils, is called the soil series. The name of the soil series that we're standing on here is the Antioch soil series. And it's characterized by this hummocky topography. You have uh, little islands, in this case over here, of raised land that's maybe three feet higher than the basins, which are in between as a mosaic, maybe, um, between the hillocks. The, there's a couple of common names that are applied to these hillocks and basins. Uh, one is um, hog wallows, is sometimes what these, these uh, basins are called, as though hogs were wallowing in there and, and creating these depressions. And the hillocks are sometimes called mima mounds, M-I-M-A, or mima mounds. All just synonyms of, of the same thing, hillocks and basins. The basins are called vernal pool basins because in the wintertime they fill with water and then they evaporate. The water either percolates back into the soil, moves in ways we're not clear because there's a hard pan under there, but the water dissipates in the spring, vernal, and uh, then the land is exposed. Because of this uh, inundation, only certain species can tolerate growing in the vernal pools, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the idea today is that you're going to be sampling, you're going to be breaking up into groups of about three people each. Each one of you is going to be given what's called a quadrat, it's a, it's a sort of square frame. And each one of you, each team, is going to be sampling once in the vernal pool basin and once on the grassland. The idea being that this morning you're going to learn quite a few species and more importantly than that, you're going to see enormous differences in the communities between these two. And they are very, there's no macro environmental differences. They're all enjoying the same rainfall. It's basically the same soil. 
But the reason that we have such different communities is microenvironmental differences. How deep is it to the hard pan, for example? And uh, in, in the course of just a few yards, and in the course of raising up only half a yard, you're going to see these enormous differences. Other communities that we look at uh, this, this course won't be so easy to sample, where they're, everything here is less than six inches tall, and when you're looking down on it, you'll be able to see the whole quadrat, and it's much more difficult when we get to the forest to do the same thing. So it's a good training exercise for us, too. Now, the, what you're seeing here on the hillocks is probably not a very unusual plant community to you or vegetation type. This is valley grassland, annual grassland that is present throughout California. It's present in a rim around the Central Valley up to about 1,500, 2,000 feet in most parts of the state. It's one of the most abundant vegetation types in California. And I'm going to just give you a little bit of history of this vegetation type because it's a fascinating thing in a way that this vegetation type that's so um, abundant here in California is one that's composed mainly of non-natives. These um, annual grasses that dominate this community type are from the Mediterranean basin. And what seems to have happened um, to our native perennials is that when there was very intense grazing pressure combined with severe drought in the 1860s, most of our grasslands, our native valley grasslands in California, made the conversion to non-native species. The native grasslands in California are generally thought to have been composed mainly of bunch grasses. Now I'm saying generally because we really don't know what they were like. There are accounts by Sp um, Spanish explorers there's various people who botanized before the 1860s, but there was nothing like a vegetation survey that could tell us what was really there. But the best guess is that there were, um, a, a, there were dominant um, bunch grasses. Oh, thanks. Um, here's one of them right here. Nacella pulchra, you might know it as stipa pulchra or purple needle grass. And um, these are unusual grasses, even for a perennial grasses, because they're bunch grasses. They grow in clumps, and all the tillers or little stem bases in, in, of the plant are coming out of a central crown. In many other perennial grasses and other parts of the country and the world, for that matter, there's underground stems that travel in, in the soil, and there are little um, shoots, little um, tillers that come up, and that clonal grass then is um, got a, probably a larger extent of a single genotype, but our native perennial grasses are by and large bunch grasses. This one, um, Nacella pulchra, is identified by its um, purple color of its little florets and its very long, delicate awns. If you were to run your finger along the back or the awn, backwards along the awn, or frontward, you just find a very, very sleek feel to it. So it's long awns, but delicately sleek. And I'm going to... Uh, okay, great. I can pass some of those around if you want. Great. So you're all aware that what, what um, I'd like you to do is grab one of those awns like this and bring your thumb and forefinger back down on it. And you'll see there's, there's no problem at all. And that's because that's going to be in contrast to um, some of the other grasses. So one of the questions is if you're out here and you want to look for native bunch grasses, how are you going to find them? Well, they're hard to see. And part of the reason is, is that some of the non-native Mediterranean grasses also have awns. Their awns tend to have little barbs on them. We'll show you that in a minute. And when you run your finger backwards on them, for example, um, on rip gut brome, a non-native grass from the Mediterranean, when I run my finger back like this, I can't. It's like there's a little um, catch on the on that prevents me from running my finger backwards. And you might ask, well, what is that? Um, there are little tiny barbs, and people think that they may be a way that these grass seeds cling to animals' fur and are easily dispersed. So I'm going to um, pass some of the rip gut brome along. Oh, but before I do that, I want to show you something here. 
that's kind of useful. How can you tell when you see a clump? If it, is it a perennial native bunch grass or is it just a big annual that has a big crown around it? Well, if you were to pull them up, and I ask you not to pull up the native perennial bunch grasses, but you can dig down and you can see that these annuals, like the rip gut brome, have a few little um, dead leaves at the base of it. But you can see it doesn't have any overwintering structure. It's an annual. If you were to look at the perennial bunch grasses, and we will show you some of those, when you look down into the clump, you see lots of um, tiller bases, some um, very hardened tissue, some, um, some structures that are allowing this plant to persist year after year. And in fact, people think that these bunch grasses could easily be ind single individuals, um, 100 or 200 years old. They can be very, very old. And the idea here in California is that um, we didn't have intense grazing pressure before European settlement so that grasses could persist for very many um, years without um, being overgrazed by the native animals that were here. So the, um, the general transition then to non-native grassland happened in the middle of the last century, and there's been a gradual invasion of new species ever since. There were some species that were identified in um, bricks of the early California missions, and now there's even more species coming into California and different, um, um, different dominance as time goes on. However, the main ones that are in California are out here in this grassland. These grasses would have germinated with the first fall rains. If you remember this year, we had very early um, fall rains, and then we had a long drought until um, early January. We didn't have much water. Probably a lot of annual grasses germinated that didn't survive during that long drought. But these plants are so abundant in their seed production that many of them did make it. And one thing to look at when you um, look at one of these individuals is the fact that they have high reproductive biomass allocation. A lot of their growth is being dedicated to their stem that carries their inflorescence. So since they're annuals and then they're in the, this variable um, water limited situation, one of their success strategies is putting a lot into seed production, producing um, many seeds and um, high reproductive allocation. There's um, also in the grassland a number of annual forbs. We're seeing an, uh, one that's very abundant, the, um, the fillery here. Fillery has the long fillery. Yes, it has a purple flowers. It's closely related to, it's in the geranium family. And it has a long seed pod. This plant, um, Fillery or Rhodium, is known to be a very commonly successful plant in dry years. And we're definitely seeing this out here. We see a pretty short grass stand and lots of Fillery, a really good indicator of a dry year. OK, um, as the day goes on, we'll show you some more of the n native annuals that are in this grassland. OK, some little violets. So these are native forbs. These are annuals. Um, let me pass these around. This is a little violet. In other years, we might see more native um, forbs. What's interesting here is we might see native forbs like the poppies. Um, here's another one, um, butter and eggs. Um, this might also be found in the pool areas. This is um, Trifaceria, is the Latin name. You're really just responsible of the English name, but I want you to be able to find it on your sheet. And it's closely related to a paintbrush or owl's clover. It's thought to be, in most cases, hemiparasitic. In other words, its roots grow into the roots of grasses, and it's able to um, pr have a either um, somewhat um, saprophytic relationship 
on the um, roots of the grasses. So I'll press butter and eggs around. Did everybody see that? Little um, yellow flowers um, in with purplish bracts beneath them. There um, are a couple of other things that Catherine just showed me. A couple of perennials that do grow here, perennial forbs, the yarrow, Achillea millifolium, very fragrant feathery leaves. And a little later in the year, we'll see a um, sort of tall inflorescence with, a, it's, a, it's in a composite, but it's got a, a kind of flat topped white inflorescence. And then this, the blue dicks, a brodea in the lily family that has um, linear um, basal leaves and um, bright um, purplish blue lily type flowers. So these are two perennial forbs that grow in the grassland. Okay, one other thing that I, I want to point out, just because it's going to be unique to find this in the um, pool areas, and that's clovers. Now, clovers can be um, common in certain years in the annual grassland, not every year, but um, in some years, these nitrogen-fixing plants can do quite well in grassland, and they are going to add to the ni net nitrogen accumulation in these soils because they can fix atmospheric nitrogen. Before moving on to just trying to um, show you the differences between various annual grasses out here, there's an important um, phenomenon that goes along with a strongly domi um, annual dominated grassland, and that's that when the plants die every year, they leave a lot of senescing material on the soil surface. And that has a big effect on the soils. Every year, all the plant material dies by and large, except for a few um, forbs and a few unusual perennial grasses. And so if we dig down, what we'll see is a very dark surface horizon where there's a lot of organic matter that's been decomposed. That um, is very rich in microbial activity. There's high microbial biomass and high organic matter in these soils. And so that there are, um, there's um, a lot of capacity for nutrient cycling, nutrient turnover in the grassland. Um, and this is in strong contrast to the vernal pools, which have much less biomass, less deposition each year, and less organic matter buildup. So can everybody see the slightly darker horizon in the top inch so of this soil? Now, in this area, the soils are quite a bit deeper than in the vernal pool areas. Okay, so what we're going to do is send you out in a minute, but first a crash course in identifying the non-native annuals in California annual grassland. And um, I've already shown you one of them, the rip gut brome. Rip gut, if you remember, has the long ons. I think uh, we passed most of that around. Long ons with miniature tiny little barbs can't slide your fing finger backwards on. You simply cannot do it. It's, it's, it snags. OK, there's another brome that has a very tiny little on. It's very delicate. Thank you. Um, you look around, and you might see it, a sh um, short um, little on at the tip, delicate little on. And it's called soft chest because it's much more palatable as the season progresses than the rip gut. And you can figure out why. The rip gut is um, really tough when it gets hard and dry later on in the season. Here's the wild oat. It has the largest seed of the ones that we're looking at. Rounded seed, fairly soft ons, ons these little things that project out from the um, seed are, oh, maybe a little less than an inch long. This thing can grow to be um, quite a large plant, larger than some of the others, um, with many um, little oats on the um, inflorescence. But it does have this characteristic way of these large seeds sort of hanging off one side of the inflorescence. You want to pass these around? OK. Another genus that's out here. Foxtails. Now, right th now, this time of year, foxtails are pretty innocuous. But later on in the year, what happens is they dry out is that their florets pop off easily from one another. 
and you get stuck in your socks, you know. I knew one person who worked in annual grassland who always wore flip-flops because they couldn't bear to always have to be picking the foxtails out of their socks. Anyway, it's an easy one to tell because it has this quite bushy arrangement of whorls of um, seeds on the head. And when you try to yank the thing apart, it comes right apart. These little joints allow the little foxtail units to split right off. So that's a, um, a wild barley, Hordium leporinum. Want to pass these around? Okay, let's see, one, one other, no, two others before you're totally confused by these. Okay, this delicate little um, inflorescence here, also on an annual, you can see that there's um, just a, almost no dead leaves at all, fine root system is one of the vulpias. It's very closely related to the fescues or, or um, festucas. Annual, and these can be either native or non-native from the Mediterranean basin. And I'm noticing that this is a pretty abundant genus out here um, today. It seems to have done well in our dry fall. Okay, two kind of um, open inflorescence annual grasses. Likewise, non-native from the Mediterranean basin. One, it's just like a little spray, almost a baby's breath type spray of um, tiny little florets, often glinting white in the, um, the sun, is um, air grass, A-I-R grass, era caryophyllea. Tiny little thing, doesn't get much taller than this. That's air grass. I'm going to pass it around. You might also see some of it near you. I see quite a bit around. Um, here's another one that's almost a look-alike, the Bryza or quaking, quaking grass. Is that what we're calling it? And it likewise has a very open inflorescence, um, but the um, florets are larger, wider and um, they're not um, quite so delicate as in the air grass. Okay, Catherine has um, one more, you want to pass that um, quaking grass around? Um, that's going to be a little bit of a confusing one, possibly, and <laughs> save it for last. It looks a lot like what? I just showed you one that looked a lot like this, kind of stacks or it looks a lot like the foxtail. It's got little stacks of, um, of um, or whorls of florets. And this is Medusa head. This is kind of interesting one ecologically because this wasn't one that came with the early Spanish settlers. This one was one that became much more prevalent in this century. Medusa head. And one of the best ways I find to tell them apart is when I yank like this, it's much harder to pull off the florets than with the foxtail. So the foxtail has a, um, its name kind of gives away that the florets pop right off. This one is tougher and it's a little bit um, shorter on, a little bit finer in, um, in stature than the Hordium leporinum or wild barley. Um, you all should know this one from weeding your lawn. It's kind of evidence that there is um, a high degree of disturbance here. Um, this is um, Hypocorus radicata, right? We're calling it cat's ear, right, Michael? We're calling it cat's ear Hypocorus radicata. And it's got um, a basal rosette of leaves that um, hang tight to the soil surface. You can really see that this, this plant preempts its base. When it germinates, it takes over the space and um, doesn't let many other plants in to compete. And then when it's time to flower, it sends up a single spike of a dandelion-type flower. Okay, there's more species than that out here. When you get your quadrats and you run into questions, name them an identifying characteristics like species A or B or a um, whorly top thing or something like that, and we'll come around and we'll help you identify them. We want you to estimate um, cover for the different species that you have. There's a good description of how to do that in your handout. You're going to be getting one of these quadrats. And your first step should be to just go look through and see what species are there. Write them down. You have one um, species list turned in per group. 
And then you go about the business of trying to estimate how much cover is there. It's explaining your handout pretty well. You can sort of imagine that you've got a pie and divide it into different sections. Another thing is like Michael showed in class, sort of try to stuff them into one corner in your mind's eye and picture what percentage that would be. Another thing is that's described in your handout is that a fist like this, that much cover is about 1% cover. So you could estimate how many fists something was, especially for the less abundant things. So who wants to paste? That's it. The toe of your left hand boot is the middle of this quadrat, approximately. Great. All right. Now make a list of, if you don't know it, pick it and I'll come back in five minutes and tell you what it is. And then we'll start to estimate cover. Well, let's get started, actually. Do you remember this thing? Was the fillery? This is the erodium or fillery. Yeah, it's got, uh, um, here's the leaves. You pay attention to the leaves, not just to the flowers when you're measuring cover. This little thing in here is all this thing. Do you remember? This is soft chest. Soft chest. How about this thing? This has long awns with red tips on them. And if you, right, if you try to rub your fingers back, you can't. Rip gut. Bromus diandris. Um, now you're going to have to see that there's a little bit difference in height. Here's the rip gut again. The soft chest is a little bit shorter. You want to be able to separate these two, even if you don't see the flowers, even if you don't see the inflorescence. What else have we got in here? What is this little um, feathery? Oh, great. This is um, in the carrot family. And we're going to call it uh, Sanical, S-A-N-I-C-L-E, Sanical. It's, uh, I think it's got a, my nose is running today, so I can't smell, but it's got a little bit of, of uh, celery um, odor. I'll be back with some others. And remember, you're going to also estimate cover by bare ground. There's your pencil back. Do you have any? There's another one too. Hmm, really big cotyledon leaves. Yeah. Um, I could make some. I'm wondering if it's. Okay, um, another confusing um, situation was when you had um, an immature um, brom bromus, mollus, uh, bromus horneaceus, bromus mollus, soft chest next to an annual fescue. And often those looked a lot alike. A little bit later, in a couple of weeks, the soft chest will have a much bigger seed. In the end, the seed of a soft chest will be about three times larger than the annual fescue. But right now, they look kind of the same because of this different developmental stages. The, an the annual fescue will be the first grass out here to um, senesce. It and the air grass will go real early. Um, any other confusing things in terms of identifying the plants? All the dead matter? Like uh-huh. Is there a percent cover for that generally? If it's Actually, if you do have that, that would be a good thing to put in. And you could also put in the amount of bare soil as well. That is a typical thing that you might be doing if you were describing the grassland through time in a given season. You would want to show that the dead matter was decaying pretty rapidly through time. We tend to see that stuff decompose pretty um, rapidly this time of year as the temperature warms up. Okay, so what were the, um, any um, kind of generalizations about native plants? Did you find many native plants at all? What percent cover native plants 
would you have? Let's say that we don't really know on the fescues, the annual fescues, if they were native or non-native. But for the ones that you did know, either the native annual or perennial forbs or the perennial bunch grasses, what was the cover? No, nope. soft chest is from the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. Blow, blow wives would be a native. That's a native forb, native annual forb. The annuals that you would have seen that would have been native were, um, some people found this little violet, native annual. There was a umble or a lomatium that your group found that um, had a top, um, a, a cyme type inflorescence, a little um, um, a bright yellow flowers. Um, some people found the brodia, the blue dicks. Any others? Does anybody find the yarrow in their plot? The blue dicks and yarrow would have been, you did? Good. Native perennial forbs. Anybody find any nacella pulchra, the purple neograph? None. Usually we find some, but I guess it didn't happen this year. So if you didn't get a chance to see that well, then do go around on the mountaintops and see if you can find some as we're walking around. Okay, so um, it probably confirmed what I already told you is that most of the plants are non-natives, non-natives from the Med Mediterranean basin, non-native annuals. Um, although... Uh Normally, uh, we'd be advised to stay out of trampling the vernal pools. They do get trampled. And I'd like us to move and sit down in the middle of this vernal pool, and we'll, we'll talk about it. What Jim is, is holding up is a map of vernal pool occurrences in the northern part of the Sacramento San Joaquin Valley. Um, so we're looking at the north part of the Great Valley. And if we look for the distribution of vernal pools in California, um, first of all, many of them do occur in the Central Valley, but that's not the only place they occur in. Um, they occur, for example, in the coast ranges. They occur in Mendocino County, in Santa Rosa County, in um, uh, no, I was thinking of along the coast, uh, Monterey County, uh, San Luis Obispo County, San Diego, whatever is left of Los Angeles County. So, and also in the uh, northeastern California, the, um, the volcanic area of northeastern California. So they're not only in the Central Valley, but probably most of them occur there. Anyway, we could say that vernal pools probably occur in maybe two-thirds of California's landscapes. But if you total up the area of the vernal pools themselves, uh, not where they occur, we've probably got less than 1% of California's total land area. But they are relictual areas. If you want to think of them as old growth uh, grassland, y you almost could, because these areas have resisted invasion by the exotics that you've seen in the grassland, and they're dominated by natives. There are some introduced plants in here, but they're not giving much biomass. Virtually everything in the vernal pools is native, and most of it's annual, native annuals. The uh, distribution of vernal pools in Sacramento Valley, you can see, mainly is along the west side the east side, excuse me, mainly along the east side of the valley. We're over here. Um, and if we were to go down to San Joaquin uh, Valley, we'd see the same thing. They're mainly on what are called terraces on the east side of the valley. These are very old surfaces. And by very old, I mean uh, up to 500,000 years old. That's extremely old for soils. Most soils in the world are less than 10,000 years old. It's unusual to get soils that are 100,000 or more years old. 
And it pains me to say this because I'm getting older, but older is not better in terms of soils. The older soils get, the more mature, uh, the nutritional level goes down. They become leached of nutrients. They may develop problems like hard pans, as we have here, and productivity on them goes down. So some of the oldest soils in the world, certainly in California, are vernal pool soils. This particular place in Solano County is not on these older terraces, it's on the youngest terrace, and so this, this soil is about 100,000 years old, still fairly old. We don't know exactly how many acres of vernal pools there were prior to agriculture or prior to <coughs> urban expansion. But Bob Holland, who did this map and has been the guru of vernal pools for 20 or so years, has tried to look at areas that um, have the same kind of soil that he knows vernal pools nearby are found on, and to use this as some sort of extrapolation. And then if he does that, we think we've lost about two-thirds of the vernal pool acreage in California over the last 200 years. And why is that important? Well, uh, they have no economic use, but in terms of biotic diversity, they're hot spots. They are areas that uh, concentrate native species, including some that are listed on either the state or federal lists as threatened and endangered. There are also animals that are threatened and endangered that grow in the water of these vernal pools. We don't see the fairy shrimp now, for example, but there are several species of fairy shrimp. There are larger uh, vertebrates that are associated with vernal pools. And so it's, uh, it's an endangered habitat because it's very prime territory for um, not farming, but uh, urban expansion. And there's a lot of research going on trying to find out how much, if you're going to protect vernal pools, uh, how much of the surrounding catchment area for, for water do you need? The water that uh, fills these pools is entirely from rainwater. It's, there's no subterranean connection. It's not, a, it's not a water table that's coming up. Can't because there's this hard pan. So everything that fills the pools comes from rainwater. How much area do you need to support the depth that, that we find in here? And hydrologists are, are busy trying to figure this out at the moment. We don't know. And yet I know from, from visits elsewhere that sometimes, uh, at the present time, uh, homes are allowed to be built within yards of the beginning of a vernal pool complex. So it's, it's still an open research question. And as I said at the beginning, uh, the Supreme Court recently uh, upheld the notion that isolated wetlands like this do not fall under the same protection rules as connected wetlands. So uh, there is a threat. So we're down to about 33 percent of, of what we uh, once had. How many vernal pool communities there are, we have no idea. Um, you know, we're treating this as though it's all the same thing, right, as we come in here. This pool basin is the same plant community as one that might be 100 yards over there. We're presuming that. But what, what's being done uh, this year and for the next two years is some very intensive sampling of vernal pools throughout California, including pools nearby as well as far away, to determine uh, how many communities are there? Uh, how much similarity between this pool is there and a pool over there? It's not a trivial question because it turns out that these species are very poor dispersers. You can think of them as island species. Plants that arrive on islands lose over evolutionary time the ability to disperse their seeds. They develop heavier seeds, they develop seeds that don't have wings, uh, that don't have, uh, that don't float, and so on. Same thing appears to have gone on in these vernal pools. Even the pollinators are fairly localized. Um, there are some generalist bees that come in here, but most of the vernal pool pollination is done by solitary native bees that build little nests in the uplands and bury their uh, eggs in there with a ball of pollen. And then when the larvae mature as winged adults, they come out and the next season pollinate. Um, on, on our campus, Robin, um, who it is Robin's last name? Robin Thorpe. Dr. Thorpe has uh, studied these these uh, bees 
for a number of years and finds they have very small areas that they pollinate. For example, um, solitary bees um, probably would not pollinate a bigger area than what we're seeing out there in this, this uh, sort of part of a pool. Which means then that there's no gene transfer from pool to pool, uh, except by the occasional generalist uh, pollinator. So over time, there, there could be uh, evolution of genetic differences, new species, even in neighboring pools. And there are a number of genera in these pools that do have uh, quite a few species. And sometimes they overlap, and sometimes they're found in separate pools. That's one of the problems of classifying these vernal pools is you need specialists who, um, who know these plants because uh, the species may have very subtle differences and yet ecologically they might mean something significantly different. They're small plants. They're called belly plants for a good reason. You've got to get on your stomach in order to see them. They have a very short window of time when they're available to sample. And, um, and they're annual, so their abundance varies from year to year. Um, how do we know that this pool, which we might classify this year as a goldfield pool with some associated species next year might be a meadow foam pool uh, or something else would be dominant instead of goldfields. So this classification problem is a difficult one and it has to be robust enough to take into account annual variations of rainfall and annual variations in vegetation. But only when we have that level of knowledge will um, probably mitigation be uh, sensible. Right now, all the pools are treated the same. And yet some are bound to be extremely local and rare types. Others might be extremely widespread, already be protected under easements or in uh, public lands. And uh, so the mitigation requirements for these different extremes should be different. Right now, it's, it's uh, very ad hoc. As a result, um, maybe reasonably so, uh, developers are frustrated. You know, they, they uh, are, they're kicked one way and another. And um, it, it could be that once we have the classification and the degrees of rarity and endangerment known for each of them, it, it will be a much more straightforward task for deciding whether development can proceed, and if it does, what kind of mitigation is necessary. Uh, I don't think you'll find it in your pools. In, in deeper pools, there's a lasthenia a gold field that doesn't have the ray flowers, that doesn't have the big uh, petals. And uh, it's Lasthenia glabarima, but um, we're not going to have it in here. So I just want you to get the idea that here's a genus that is speciated in vernal pools. And sometimes you might have more than one species in the same pool. Um, another um, annual uh, forb you've already seen is the butter and eggs. Uh, it's recently changed its genus. And there's more than one species actually in here, but we're going to uh, just treat it as one species. One of the species, this one, um, has green leaves. Another species has purple uh, colored foliage. So um, I think in this particular area, we're only going to see the, the green version. Another colorful plant has white petals like this. And I don't see any uh, here at the moment. This is meadow foam, right. That's meadow foam folded up. Meadow foam. You've got some uh, folded up, right. And some of it's kind of toasted already. That's it. That's it. And I got some in a wetter area where the petals are still out. And uh, when it's out, it deserves the name meadow foam because it sort of dominates an area like foam from the ocean that's settled on the land. Meadow foam, limnanthes. Only one species. Um, you may find a tiny white flower that looks like this. And it's called popcorn flower. Plagiobotrys is the genus. And um, it's usually in the wetter areas. Look how much smaller it is than the meadow foam. Oops, I've lost it. I don't even have enough to, to carry it around. 
tiny white flowers that look like popcorn kernels that have popped. Plagiobotrys or popcorn flower. Um, one more forb before I show you some grasses is it's a very characteristic forb and I see some around us here. It looks like a thistle. It's, it's got basal leaves that have uh, teeth coming out. Anybody see this near you? It's very prostrate. This is called um, coyote thistle. That's all, oops, that's it, coyote thistle, right? That's it. Coyote thistle, uh, like everything else in here, begins uh, its life underwater when the pools are filled. And when it's underwater, the leaves are not spiny like this. They're, they're, they're very highly dissected and very soft. And then when the water retreats and the foliage, uh, new foliage develops in air, it develops these bristles on it like a thistle. Maybe there's an anti-herbivore strategy. Anyway, it's able to change its leaf morphology during its lifespan. Okay, grasses. Um, too bad where I'm sitting, I don't see any standing up. So, oh, it is. Oh, yeah, there's a whole bunch. A little bunch right there. Oh, that looks like an onion. Um, the biggest grass you'll see, and I'll pass this around, is called, um, uh, phleum or canary grass, and it's got this very compact <coughs> head, and it's uh, usually the tallest grass you're going to see. Oh, rats, did I run out already? I'm afraid I did. Pass that around. It's called canary grass. I'm going to just take that away from you. <laughs> Pass this around. Canary grass, a native uh, annual in the grassland. Did we get uh, hair grass in here, you guys? Oh, thanks. A beautiful grass, maybe the, uh, the finest in here is called hair, H-I-I-R, not air, hair grass. Thanks, here's some more. And the characteristics of it is it's, it's, it's purple color and just very fine. <laughs> okay, so, so far we've had um, phleum, the, the uh, what do they call it, the common name? Canary. Canary grass and hair grass, Deschampsia is the genus of that. And a third one, which is very unique morphology, is called semaphore grass because the florets kind of hang out like flags on, uh, signals from ships to ships. Do you believe me or is this too good? <laughs> this is called, <laughs> I mean, made up the reason they called it that, right? uh, I didn't and I wanted you to believe me. <laughs> semaphore grass, semaphore grass. And the stamens, this, this is why my pollen, my allergies are acting up. The stamens, the anthers are hanging out. Um, there are other grasses and other forbs, but instead of loading you down now, I, I, I'd like you to to divide up into groups again, the same groups if you'd like. Oh, like all right, there's one more thing. Now there are some very small things that are almost toast now, and when we're visiting you, we'll, we'll point those out to you. But there is a, uh, a spike rush that's in here. It's a little bit like a juncus, like a, a rush plant. And it, at the very tip, it has some very small flowers. Spike rush is the genus Eleocharis, E-L-E-O-C-H-A-R-I-S, Eleocharis. And there's probably about two species in here. And they are nibbled, because here's some that have been nibbled and the heads have gone. Here's one that still has the inflorescence at the tip. So this is a monocot, and it's got uh, air tissue in it. It's very well adapted to growing in saturated soils. 
and then I'll stop at, at that one. Divide up again. Um, I'd like uh, two groups to follow me. Again, it could be different groups than last time. Get your uh, quadrats back there and meet me over here. And likewise, let's everybody divide up. Two groups together, come over here. Uh, Louise is over that way. Boy, this is really open. This is really open. Yeah, but there's also a lot of the um, native myrtle pole species in here too. Yeah, butter and eggs. Let's see. Let's just take a look what's in here. Um, this is a um, native here that he, he talked about. Remember the one that looked like a thistle but wasn't really a thistle. It has, he talked about it having one type of leaf that came out when it first germinated and then as it gets older, it has this um, leaf with the spiky tips. It's a tougher leaf. It doesn't, um, it, it, it lasts actually quite a long time as the pool dries. The answer is, always has to do with um, the unexpected importance of wild nature to humans. Um, we're finding out more and more about the, the balance of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and how um, natural plant cover might modify that. We're also, uh, I think, um, maybe the word isn't aesthetic, it's um, more in the nature of uh, do we have the right to uh, end the lifespan of species? Do we have the right to take away uh, wilderness areas from our children or their children? Um, what, what is it that we might owe wild nature? And that's for each person to determine. I'm an ecologist because I happen to think that wild nature has a lot to teach us about how even human societies could be organized. Plant societies, plant communities are complicated and we begin to see when we look at them over time how each species has its own optimum year and how they uh, compete with each other and how they mitigate that competition, how they share resources. So it may be a, a big limp, uh, leap <laughs> to go from plant communities to human communities, but there is that link. I think more to the point is there are species in here that have been evolving and living for millions of years, and I personally don't want to be uh, seeing them disappear during my watch when I'm here. I'd like to see examples of wild nature uh, protected in California. We can't, we can't do that with the whole landscape. We have a population of 33 million, but um, we can protect uh, and maintain some small percent, surely, of that original distribution. I don't want to see them protected like pieces of, of zoos where uh, this area might be surrounded by high-rise buildings. I'd like to see buffers also around those protected areas. And you need to have areas big enough that they can maintain themselves without human beings uh, managing them uh, actively. How big a piece of vernal pool topography do you need to be self-maintaining? We don't know. How big of a piece of old growth uh, mixed conifer forest do you need before it's self-maintaining? Is 10 acres enough? Is 100 acres enough? We don't have those answers yet, but we're working on it. So I prefer to say until we have the answers, leave as much as possible. <laughs>